New York City is made up of five distinct boroughs. The most well-known one bears the name of the island it covers, Manhattan. The island is bristling with skyscrapers, which give it its characteristic skyline. New York's skyline is very varied, and the forms evolve rather like shadows. But how do they manage to organize such an urban panorama in such a limited space? It's very complicated to build in New York um, for many reasons. Taking buildings down is not so easy if they are contributing to a historic district, and New York is adding more and more historic districts over time, and so it's very difficult to take those down. Skyscrapers spring up in New York almost without a pause. But the movement has accelerated since the beginning of the 21st century. I think there's been a lot of interest in what's happening after 9-11. The Freedom Tower is a new dynamic building shape on the skyline and really changed the lower Manhattan. I'm always fascinated by the historic buildings, um, like you say, the Empire State Building or the Chrysler Building. But I think that there was a period where there weren't a lot of interesting buildings, but now you see all of the top architects from around the world building in the city. Strange to say, between Midtown, the central part of Manhattan, and Downtown, the south of the island, there is not one skyscraper on the skyline. This area is entirely composed of townhouses or buildings that are rarely more than 10 stories high. Why is this? The reason why there's more skyscrapers downtown is because of Wall Street. New York City started downtown. It was the center of finance. People wanted to be as close as they could to the stock exchange. Then when you go further north, you get to Greenwich Village. It was rich people who didn't want to be in the congestion of downtown. Another reason is that they're very close to Grand Central. So people are commuting into the city. It's an easy way to just walk a couple blocks and get to your office building. And what styles are favored today by the architects building these new skyscrapers? The most important trends now in New York City are tall, slender glass buildings. Many new towers are rising to 1,000, 1,100, 1,300 feet. Instead of building a building that's wide and tall, if you build it skinny, you can go so much further up. These buildings want to have really amazing views of Central Park or of the downtown skyline. One wonders whether such slim buildings are really stable. So the slender buildings are very solid and the engineers have to account for the wind and the sway of the building. So a lot of them have um, something called a tuned mass damper, which helps to counter the sway of the building. And that makes it so when someone's in bed, 1,200 feet up in the air, they're not gonna get seasick. In New York, real estate agents are forever in no holds barred competition. The only limit is the sky and the cost. To gain a patch of sky, one can even buy the air. The way the air rights work is that the buildings around you, once you buy the air right, they no longer can build up. So you're taking that space that they used to be able to build and adding it onto your building. Some skyscrapers are natural landmarks in New York. The One World Trade Center is also a symbol because it replaces the Twin Towers destroyed in 2001. Even its height is symbolic, 380 meters or 1,776 feet, 1776, the year of American independence. From the observatory at the top, one can see for 80 kilometers or 50 miles. Looking down, visitors seem to see the town slide away. It's a surefire thrill. The Empire State Building was for many years the tallest in the world. If you include the height of its mast, it's just slightly taller than the Chrysler Building. By their style and decoration, the two buildings represent the finest Art Deco architecture of New York. Buildings are adapted to their surroundings. So the Flatiron is triangular in shape because Broadway at its foot is not perpendicular to the other streets. The headquarters of the United Nations is a collective work by 11 architects, one of whom was Le Corbusier. And in front of one of the centers of world diplomacy, 
the most fragile of the world's causes seek an audience. Some buildings have adapted their shape to their use. This is the case for the Lincoln Center, which opens its halls to culture. Several institutions have made it their headquarters, such as the Metropolitan Opera and the New York City Ballet, one of the most important dance and ballet companies in the world. The neoclassical architecture offers a grandiose framework for New York's public library. It's the largest in the country with 17 million readers a year. From the ancient literary works to the new methods of reading, times have changed. It was French Gothic architecture which inspired the style of the St. John the Divine Cathedral. Work started at the end of the 19th century, but because of technical and financial problems, it is still not finished. The building belongs to the Episcopal Church of the United States, which is the American name of the English Anglican Church. One wonders whether the cathedral will ever be finished, but it is already the biggest in the world. One has to go to the extreme north of Manhattan to find another amazing religious construction, the cloisters. Parts from five French abbeys were transported on the Hudson River and reassembled in an edifice museum especially designed for them. Nancy Wu is the curator. The history of the cloisters goes back to George Gray Barnard, an American sculptor who lived in France from the turn of the century, of the 20th century. He collected the bulk of the collection that you see at the cloisters today, which was sold to a Metropolitan Museum in 1925 with funds provided by John D. Rockefeller, the junior. The richest collection of medieval art of the American continent is gathered here in the cloisters. In the Middle Ages, the abbeys had cloisters which were the meeting places for monks. And also there were gardens. At the cloister from Saint-Michel de Cusha near Perpignan, you have a typical medieval cloister uh, garth, that is a garden enclosed by the arcades of a cloister. On the lower level, there is an herb garden that is used as our primary teaching garden of plants used in the Middle Ages. Certain plants had to be used very carefully. Far from the peace of the cloisters, right in the heart of Midtown, another emblematic building sees 276 million visitors pass through it each year. Grand Central Station. The clock with its four dials is one of the city's most traditional meeting points. Inside the station, one can also reach the subway, the form of transport most used by New Yorkers. The express trains don't stop at all the stations, whereas local trains stop everywhere. The subway also sets its mark on New York's image. There you'll find numerous works of art on the tiled walls. Many of them have recently been restored, and the network is now commissioning young artists. Forty percent of the network is above ground, mainly outside Manhattan. The subway has more than 400 kilometers of track. In the old days, the trains were the target of taggers. But now, they attract other talents. In the New York scene, certain details are surprisingly rustic. The water tanks positioned on the roofs are not very contemporary, but they are part of the sites of the town. They are everywhere. There are thousands of them. Even though sometimes they're half hidden, you can't ignore them. 
The tanks first appeared in town during the 19th century, and they haven't changed their look since then. Technological evolution has passed them by. They have always been made of wood. They give a very simple solution to a complex problem. Building the town vertically has meant that solutions were required for all its technical challenges. Andrew Rosenbach's family has owned a tank-making workshop since 1865. The water tanks are a uh, consequence of a vertical city that's built over six stories. The reservoirs that feed the water to the city are equivalent to a six-story building. So anything over six stories has to be provided with a means of maintaining pressure. And one way of doing that is to put a reservoir on top of the building. But for what reason have water tanks never been made of materials other than wood? Well, the water tanks uh, basically in New York City are made out of wood. Uh, years ago, it was a redwood from uh, Northern California. Today, we use a Western cedar uh, from British Columbia. It's very well forested. Wood is a natural insulator. Three inches of wood is equivalent to 24 inches of concrete. And in New York, we have severe winters that are down to uh, five degrees in, in, in cold and 105 degrees in, in, in heat. And uh, therefore, with wood, we have the waters kept cool in the summer. And, and, and somehow, uh, we, we have a good insulated uh, factor in the winter. But with all the high-performance materials that exist today, is wood really the most suitable? The uh, tanks are maintenance-free. We do have an aging factor, and that, that does cause deterioration on the wood, and therefore an average tank uh, properly uh, put together with old-growth lumber would last between 30 to 35 years. Sometimes the tanks seem like works of art. 